Dean Brinkerhoff and I are here with a very special episode of Digging the Details. I keep thinking this is once in a lifetime, but it's not once in a lifetime. It's a, it's once in forever. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Walt Disney Company, which was founded on October 16th, 1923. We were thinking about what's the best way to celebrate 100 years. We think we have a very special subject. So uh, I'm Jim Fanning, and I'd like to welcome my co-host, who is the wonderful Disney author, historian, artist, and just plain enthusiast, Dean Brinkerhoff. Dean, welcome to this special episode. <laughs> Jim, thank you for that kind welcome. I feel very welcome. <laughs> and I am so thrilled that we can be here to celebrate, like you said, this once and forever occasion I am very excited and thrilled that we can get together and talk about this today. Jim, you are, of course, a wonderful author, historian, and all-around Disney enthusiast as well. And it's wonderful that we can discuss some juicy things today about Disney 100. <laughs> well, thank you, Oswald. Or are you Julius? I'm never sure. But anyhow, today we're going to discuss some prestigious Disney films that have been celebrated and honored by their inclusion on the Library of Congress's National Film Registry. For those of you who don't know, every year the National Film Registry adds 25 films that they think are very important to the American people. And they have, they have a very beautiful, I think, summary on their website. So Dean, maybe you, you could just read that to us. Yeah, absolutely. Their summary reads, it is a list of films deemed culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant that are recommended for preservation by those holding the best elements for that film, be it motion picture studios, the Library of Congress, and other archives or filmmakers. These films are not selected as the best American films of all time, but rather as works of enduring importance to American culture. They reflect who we are as a people and as a nation. Yes, and I think that's beautifully stated and beautifully read. <laughs> so thank you for that. No problem. Agreed. The um, films are, uh, there are any number of films nominated every single year from which the 25 are chosen. And anyone can re can nominate any film. So if there's a film, as you're hearing from us about this uh, wonderful program, or you go and investigate yourself at their website, which is on the Library of Congress website, it's within that loc.gov, and you think that a certain film should be on their film registry board or film registry uh, list, then you can nominate a film. We're going to take a look at some of the Disney films that are on it because it. I think it's very significant and important to know that the Disney films that people forget are not just Disney classics, quote unquote. They are classics of all time, of all cinema history. So um, it's wonderful that they have been recognized over the years. And there's a, there's a fairly good number. Who set up the National Film Registry and why? And it says, Congress established the National Film Registry with passage of the National Film Preservation Act of 1988. The genesis for the <laughs> legislation arose from various developments. The 1980s had proved a transformational decade in American cinema. Multiple cross currents changed the landscape from production financing, distribution channels, home entertainment markets, artist rights, technical alteration of movies, and color film preservation. These oft conflicting trends led to congressional involvement over the issue of, quote, material alteration, notably the colorization of black and white. 
This is about the preservation of these films that are deemed so significant. Who selects the films on the registry? The Librarian of Congress makes the annual selections to the registry after reviewing thousands of titles nominated by the public and conferring with the distinguished members of the National Film Preservation Board and library film curators. To me, it's quite thrilling. We are uh, a government by the people. So this, and this is Congress who represents the people and is the people. So it's kind of thrilling that this is taken so seriously and looked at so carefully. And it does come from the people. That's where, as I was saying, that's where the nominations come from. So all, all quite fascinating. And for anyone who gets Turner Classic Movies, the last few years at least, they've made the announcement on Turner Classic Movies in December. Every December for the last few years, the Librarian of Congress is, comes on Turner Classic Movies with one of their hosts. And they not only make the announcement of the 25 titles, they talk about them, they show clips, the, they have a discussion about them. It's thrilling. So who knows? In December, there might be another Disney film on the list. It'll be very interesting to see. <laughs> well, Jim, I know for me and for probably many in the audience watching as well, it has a, there is a question in my mind as to how some of these films get put on that list. So that really does explain it well. And it shows how neat of a thing this list is being a list that a sum up of uh, what people want um, to be recognized as culturally significant and uh, very important in our history, etc. So that's awesome. And I think um, we're due to get some neat new entries coming up in December. <laughs> I think so. And personally, I'm always fascinated to see what what's been added yeah uh, excited to see. yeah so uh just to give everyone a little bit of a context here are some of the films that are not disney films that have been added over the years for example we have the long goodbye the lord of the rings fellowship of the rings a nightmare on elm street we have strangers on a train Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, The Booze Brothers, The Hurt Locker, Lilies of the Field, Boys Don't Cry, Coal Miner's Daughter. Uh, just an amazing array of fantastic films that have so much to say about who we are. Gentlemen's Agreement, The Goonies, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. The oh. Wizard of Oz. <laughs> Indeed. Um, and I like it because, again, perhaps Nightmare on Elm Street is an example, not always what you would expect. Right. You know, so, and, and the reasons for choosing these and um, the thought behind it is what makes it so interesting and important. So when we say, well, what's that film doing on there? It's very interesting to find out what the thinking is. So each of the, on the website, each of the films has a little bit of an essay, sometimes also a much larger essay by a film historian, but it, it explains why a particular film is on there. 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea is on the list, but it's the 1916 version, the silent version. <laughs> so how wonderful is that? Um, Very cool. I definitely know we'll get into some of the Disney titles here in a minute as well. Yes, absolutely. Of, of these other films that are non-Disney. But I do think, I agree with you, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea from from Disney in the 1950s should be on there. That's one I would vote for, certainly. <laughs> yes, I would from too. Special effects and just the cultural phenomenon it was. I agree with you 100%. And is. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take a look at some of the films that are some of the Disney films that are on the list. Um, is there one that stuck out to you as, as a favorite or one that you said, oh yes, this has to be on there? 
well, you've got it playing in the background. <laughs> Snow White, the fairest one of all. <laughs> if that one wasn't on there, I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> Snow White was a extremely groundbreaking film in terms of storytelling and animation. Everybody, you know, heard all that before, but it's really significant that that would be on there to preserve it, to make sure that all generations in the future get to experience it. Because it was the first, it was started at all for, you know, Disney and then all the other subsequent uh, film studios that went on to make animated films. We would not have many of the other wonderful classics we enjoy today if it wasn't for Snow White setting that trail blaze, that trail of blaze. Well, wonderfully put. Couldn't agree more. It's important to note, to your point, Dean, about how Snow White has to be on this list. It really must be. It was one of the first of the first 25 that was announced, which was in 1989. And Snow White was on that very, very first list of 25 films. As it should. As it should, indeed. So not only historically important because because it was the first full-length animated feature but as you said the storytelling the cinematic grasp of Walt Disney and his associates in creating this astounding film which people take for granted people sometimes look down on it's obvious they haven't looked at it there's been some recent criticism if you read it it's like did they even watch the film? Because right. what, what they're saying isn't even true. So, and that's just an objective fact. I mean, you know, certainly you can watch Snow White and not like it. Yeah. But no yeah. one can deny its importance. And it's astounding. The audacity of its cinematic storytelling has influenced everyone from Orson Welles to Steven Spielberg and beyond. When I wrote about it in Disney 23 magazine, that's what I focused on was its incredible audacity. Because remember, what was happening with really most animation at the time, but Walt Disney animation. Uh, there was a lot of fun animals and music, um, delightful personality, but overnight somehow while disney took kind of took you by the <laughs> by the front of your shirt and shook you up <laughs> and said that's not what this is this grabbed is you by the lapel and <laughs> grabbed you, grabbed, yes thank you you said it much better um and that's one reason that there was when it, when snow white was in production people said oh come on a feature-length cartoon? How could that be? 90 minutes of these animals romping around and this this music? It's foolish and the color is going to hurt your eyes. Yes. All kinds of criticism. And I always, re I always remember Ward Kimball and telling the story of that, his, his summary of it. Well, Walt was a better storyteller than that. In other words, that's what it was all about. That's not what you were going to get. So even right. if we take the elements of Snow White, Snow White is so lovely, so charming, so beautiful. The dwarfs are so funny, lovable, great personalities. Is that what he starts with? No. He starts with this incredibly dramatic, powerful character of the queen. Had anyone ever seen anything like this? Never. The magic mirror incredible what are we watching if you could go back and think about it what is this that we are watching is this is a disney film where are the little animals they're coming but where are they <laughs> and only after that incredible powerful introduction do we get snow white and here is this beautifully done animated this beautifully animated human character that had not been done done really this beautifully before and then the prince who is not in the film very much because of the challenge of animating especially a male character he's very well done yeah and they have the boldness to have him have a whole song <laughs> 
So people don't remember that. People say, oh, the prince is hardly in it because he was so hard. And he has his whole song and he's, he's very well done. So I think with any of these great filmmakers, Orson Welles, John Ford, Frank Capra, you name it, that's part of what they did as artists was, was audacity. They had the audacity right. to go beyond what you, you walked in that theater and wow, just hit in the face with this incredible thing that gave you such a wallop. So that's sort of my reaction to it and why it must be on the list. And I guess my reaction to your reaction would be I 100% agree <laughs> and think that it's very easy to overlook Snow White as it was the first, it was, you know, a very good attempt and very successful attempt at making a wonderful animated story come to life in a way that never had been done previously. And when people really stop to take a look at it and focus on Snow White as, as it is, they will realize it is actually very spectacular in every single way. Like you mentioned, even just the prince gets his own own song, and that was very, very risky. It's bold of the bold move, <laughs> as they are. You know, all of the different personalities and characterizations of the dwarves that they went through multiple processes of trying to find the right names and the right personalities, and um, turned out to be a wonderful comedic aspect of the film as well as you have the strong emotional the romance the the danger it has it all it's got all and all the above which is what walt himself said that's why he chose it as, as the subject for his first feature it was the perfect story earlier this year walt disney's cinderella received an extensive restoration and color correction with a new release to disney plus and on 4k blu-ray for the Disney 100 celebration, the magicians at the Walt Disney Studio and Archives have finished the same all-encompassing treatment for the fairest one of all, Walt Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. This historically accurate restoration has been released on 4K Blu-ray through the Disney Movie Club and debuted today, October 16th on Disney Plus to commemorate the very date the Walt Disney Company was founded 100 years ago. So, Jim, what would you say is uh, one of your top picks from this list of Disney films they've included? Well, they're all so great, it's hard to say, but I gravitate toward Old Yeller. Ooh. Because this is another aspect of Walt Disney that's not always remembered, and then if it is, it's kind of looked down upon often, is that he was also a phenomenal live-action producer. And Old Yeller a completely unique story. I mean, just as we, just as you were saying, Snow White has everything. So does Old Yeller. <laughs> uh, it really does. It has so much humor. It has so much drama. Uh, it, it's, it's unexpected. You don't know where it's going next. It, it's its own world. It tells you things about this world that you wouldn't know, this frontier world. Uh, where what what are the struggles of these folks that live in basically a log cabin? <laughs> what would that be like? And the way they have to relate to their own land, but the, the the natural world around them, and then how this dog character fits into that. And that's a great Walt Disney subject, of course. Uh, you know, all of it is front the frontier American history, but you know the dog character. That's a real Disney thing. But it also has great acting from Dorothy McGuire, Moochie, <laughs> Kevin Corcoran, but especially, especially Tommy Kirk. His performance is one for the ages in this movie. Absolutely. And this is not Merlin, this is not Merlin Jones, even though I love Merlin Jones. This is an incredibly rounded dimensional real performance that has multi hues and dimensions within it i mean he's the star he's the main character he is the one that 
we see the film through the, his we see it through his eyes and his reaction to old yeller his reaction to old yeller that he doesn't he doesn't even like the dog at first and comes you know comes to be convinced through the unfolding of the story and then of course uh, spoiler alert <laughs> <laughs> Uh, which I think we've talked about before, uh, maybe. Um, Old Yeller has the audacity to have this main dog character, this beloved character that Tommy Kirk's character has come to love so much through the film, and therefore the audience does too. He is killed and many people have been traumatized by that. <laughs> but what audacity, again, to tell the truth of that. And then when Walt was questioned about that, maybe that's not suitable for a Disney film. Well, he wasn't going to be listening to that, first of all. Right. He wasn't into formulas. But also he was like, that's what this story is. It's the American frontier this dog is bitten by a rabid animal and gets rabies himself. They had to destroy him. They had to. So they took the storytelling then to another level by not only having this dog shot, <laughs> this beloved character, this beloved animal in the show, but it was up to Tommy Kirk's character, Travis, to do it. So that takes it to a whole other level that he accepted the responsibility and said, no, I need to be the one to do it if it needs to be done. And his mother would have done it, uh, but he knew that it was up to him. Right. He had to be the one to do it. So it's this incredible, moving, unexpected story. And it is kind of one of, one of the movies that I would love to be able to erase all memory of it from my mind and be able to watch it un completely unaware. Because if we think of audiences in 1957, what? <laughs> what? I, <laughs> I mean, a lot got of, punched in the gut. <laughs> yes, and a lot of people today at least know if they watch Old Yeller, they've heard. Yeah. Thanks to people like us <laughs> telling them. <laughs> However, I will add that I do think it has a really great replay value. I, I think it's still entirely a wonderful film to enjoy over and over again, despite, you know, knowing the big old spoiler, kind of like Star Wars um, with some of its big spoilers. I, I still can rewatch those over and over for their deep artistry and wonderful production quality. But you're right. I wish I could re watch with an erased mind and <laughs> yeah just to experience the punch like you said right the emotional punch. honestly but i agree with you about replay value but that's true that's true of any great film yeah so a lot of them on, on this list whether disney or not would be the same once the once the surprises are sprung if there are surprises within large or small then you focus on the the artistry of how it was set up, how it was told, how it unfolds. And often, Absolutely. often there's like a deliciousness to it, <laughs> to experience that. I wouldn't exactly call that with old yeller, but there's a lot of, there's so much more to it. The entire film before it, all the incidents leading up to it. And of course, that's why it does have such an emotional punch because of these incredible scenes. The way they weaved it all together was very well done. And Dean, who directed Old Yeller? Uh, the director was Robert Stevenson, and he was a early director at this point for Disney. Um, it's probably his second or third film for Disney, but he went on to do many others that were many others that have over the years become large classics. He went on to direct a very notable filmography for Disney including such films as The Absent Minor Professor and Mary Poppins, among others. Yeah, he was really the premier live-action director of that of that era, which, uh, uh, you know, as Walt got, really got into live-action films, 
seems he turned to Robert Stevenson for the most important titles. And uh, Old Yeller, I mean, compare, it's amazing, compare Old Yeller to Mary Poppins. Uh, Robert Stevenson could do it all and do it beautifully. Looking at his films, we can see that Robert Stevenson uh, was great with the actors, among, uh, you know, let alone anything else. Right. He was well known for at least seeing what it is there on the screen, getting great performances, and we can certainly see that in Old Yeller. And those films are quite different, the Mary Poppins and Old Yeller, but you can definitely see how his hand can, or you can definitely see how his work really directly played a part in each of those films. Old Yeller being a very Americana type film and Mary Poppins being a very British type film. It's American nice, but still right. it takes place in London. It takes place Yeah the across the ocean. So <laughs> Yeah, the and the, the elements are all British. Yeah. So very unique different styles and approaches to everything but just as you said wonderful actors wonderful songs wonderful you know entire production um in mary poppins but then also in old yeller very well weaved americana story oh that's a great point for anyone who's wondering yes mary poppins is on the national film registry <laughs> to no one's surprise i'm sure do you have another film that you that stood out to you as as one of your favorites Yes, I would say for a more modern film from Disney that still feels like a classic to me, I would say Beauty and the Beast from 1991. It's a tale as old as time. It's a classic um, in literature. But for Disney, it came during their renaissance. And in celebration of Disney 100, I think it's neat to look back on all ages, all eras of the Disney proper um, I mean, that includes the live action, too, but I, for animation, think of Beauty and the Beast the most when I think of the Renaissance. Um, certainly, there are other wonderful titles in that era, but Beauty and the Beast is my go-to for the wonderful way the story is told, incredible cast, incredible songs, very emotional film with lots of humor as well. It's a quite balanced film, just like we were talking about with Snow White. Um, it has all the elements um, needed for a well-rounded story, and it's very memorable. I think that certainly the preceding films, like The Little Mermaid, helped the Renaissance era of filmmakers hone their craft, but Beauty and the Beast, I think, was a summation of a lot of the efforts of the people at that time during the late 80s coming together, trying their best to make a film that Walt Disney would be proud of. And I know a lot of the filmmakers, such as Don Hahn and Howard Ashman even, were really trying to give at least part of themselves that loved what Walt Disney did with his projects over to what they were creating in order to convey to a new generation of children and film goers and adults um, a story that could mean something to them, and certainly it did. I grew up with Beauty and the Beast, just as I did with Walt Disney's classics, and I consider that to be the closest, if not up there with Walt Disney's animated great. Well, that's wonderful to hear, and I, I think it is a worthy successor. Yeah. And I think, I think with both The Little Mermaid, which is also on the National Film Registry list, uh, I believe it was just added last year, and Beauty and the Beast. Again, this was filmmakers saying, look, <laughs> we have this art form. We're taking it and making it. And we are not just making, you know, whatever. We are making a film that's going to stand up to any other film. Right. I believe, if my memory serves, Ron Clemens said that very thing when they set out to make The Little Mermaid. They were like, well, we're doing this. We're doing this. And nobody's, nobody's going to tell us 
you can't make a film as great as Walt Disney or you can't make a film as great as anybody else. We're making a great film. So it is with Beauty and the Beast. And I can see why you would choose The Little Mermaid kicked off the Renaissance and of course is a great, yeah. great film. I can see why you would choose Beauty and the Beast. Beauty and the Beast has a, such a uniqueness to it. So it's not formulaic like you'd said earlier. Yeah, good point. About Walt Disney's films. Yeah, and the the, the title reflects it. There's uh, Beauty, uh, who is a Disney princess, and she's unique in her own right. She's wonderfully done. But there's yeah. also a Beast, who is this absolutely unique character. He's I would, got some audacity. <laughs> yeah, they have the audacity to say we can convey this Beast who is an anti-hero, really. Right. And, and when have you seen that in a Disney film, a Disney animated film? You know, this is incredibly unique and a high achievement. And that's, of course, what you always want. You always want to raise the bar to go beyond what was done before. Walt Disney certainly wanted to make Beauty and the Beast. There are plans to do so, and he kept setting it aside because he couldn't quite figure out how to do the story. There were, there were intricacies to the story. Had he produced it, I'm sure the Beast would also have been a great character. But here was this new generation, the Renaissance team. <laughs> yeah. Taking the art of animation, making it their own. And I think the Beast is the symbol of that. His design, who he is, how he acts, how he moves, his, his story, his tragedy, his... His sharp edges and his yes, his rough edges. Exactly, all of that. What a fascinating character! Absolutely fascinating for a Disney film or any film. So for for films supposedly made for children only. Yes, yeah, so supposedly <laughs> is right because of course it was not. Right. And the proof of the pudding was. This was the first animated feature ever to be nominated for Best Picture by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. So Which that goes to show. yeah. <laughs> so that really proved it. They set out to do it. They set out to make something that was better than anything before. And they did it. Yeah. Now I'm not saying <laughs> it's better than Snow White or better than Pinocchio or better than Fantasia. Of course, it's all relative. but I Yeah, but exactly. for a new generation who is brand new, really, they had yeah. not been making films that long, to, to take the art of Disney animation and make it their own and to have such a triumph. It's, that is an important distinction to make, absolutely. Well, you you made it. <laughs> and a great... A great choice from that list i think thank you disneyland dream is an entry on this film registry list that is a disney topic but it's actually not a disney film it's a home video it's a home film made by the barstow family who were who are a small family that won a contest that got them a trip to disneyland and they filmed their four-day trip we can enjoy it as a piece of cultural pop phenomenon as a snapshot of what Disneyland used to look like back in its infancy. It has changed a lot, <laughs> but this film shows what it looked like back in 1956. And it's quite an unusual entry for this list because it's not one that I certainly would have thought of being on a Library of Congress collection list. Um, but looking at what this film is, you certainly can see the value. You can see the cultural significance. We keep saying that word, but it's true. The importance of remembering this time and what an impact it made on Anaheim, California, and certainly, you know, the United States in general. Many global leaders and people from all over the world have come to Disneyland to see what Walt Disney brought to the world. And it's quite a, quite a sight to see. <laughs> well, I agree. And, and a complete surprise, but the, you made such good points about why it's uh, important culturally, but it's also important because 
Um, and I think that's one reason it's on here is it represents all home movies. <laughs> it represents right. all, you know, the movies that people have made just their, on their own without it being obviously not a Hollywood film, obviously not, you know, uh, an expensive film, obviously millions of dollars were not sp spent on this. So it shows that any film of any length or any origin is eligible to be on the National Film Registry. And it really represents all filmmakers, you know, whether professional or somebody that's just doing it for their own enjoyment, something they want to remember, whatever the motivation is. It's, it's a particularly well-made home movie because it's the, the, the family gave it a structure and it isn't just random shots, but even, you know, even so, I think it does represent home movies and, and, and they had become, you know, in the fifties, they were becoming more and more popular where people had money to buy film equipment, uh, the baby boom, people wanted to have film of their children and their family experiences. So that was a real boom time for, uh, home movies. And um, it's just it's just kept on growing till today. Yeah, even down to the present day, I, I make home movies every time I go to Disneyland. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I think that's a great choice, Dean. We've talked a lot about the films that are included on the National Film Registry. Are there any that you think should be on there and are not, Dean? We've talked about. 20,000 Leagues as an example, the Walt Disney's version. What else? Well, that certainly is high on the list. I also would probably myself, you can read me like a book, I'd probably vote for Tron 1982 for its groundbreaking use of computer animation and film. Tron was groundbreaking for its use of CGI and for the way they interwove it with a special process they used to make the characters look like they were in a computer. It was something that had never really been done in the exact way they did it on Tron, uh, the way they used certain filters and filmed it in black and white and added color later to the costumes. And it's quite an interesting stylization looking at the film and its end product, but I think it works and that it's very culturally significant and should be added to the list one day. Well, I agree with you. And it's a feature length story using these processes. So that's a whole other, right. that's sort of a game changer, almost as it was with hand drawn animation for Snow White. There's, it's a whole different ball game to tell a whole feature length story. And I think the story itself, it's so unique. It's, it's just utterly unique and of itself that that alone kind of elevates it to a special place. Everyone watching should definitely read Dean's article about Tron, which is wonderfully written and absolutely insightful. And that's on the community <laughs> blog. Yeah. Uh, and there's lots of other great articles on there as well. But this, don't miss Dean's article. And you can even hear Dean read his article. Where where can we hear you read it, Dean? You can hear me read it on my YouTube channel, <laughs> Dean Brinkerhoff's On the Brink. Now, Jim, what's another pick that you would want to see on this registry? Well, the pressure's on, Dean. <laughs> um, there's so many films that Walt Disney made shorts and full-length features and featurettes. Uh, but I think I gravitate toward uh, Swiss Family Robinson. We already talked about 20,000 Leagues. That's at the top of the list as far as I'm concerned. But Swiss Family Robinson's another great epic adventure that has a lot of unique elements to it. A great cast, great direction by Ken Anakin, location filming, uh, and 
this uh, family of people with in very interesting characters and kind of an adventure you're swept up in because you're imagining what, wow, what, would, what if that was me and what would I do on this island? And they are, uh, the, the, the people in the family are so relatable that you can imagine yourself being there and being part of it. So, but I think it's, it's epic adventureness. It's just so well made that that alone would put it on the registry as far as I'm concerned. I would agree with you, and I'd definitely vote for that to be on the registry as well, Jim. The the story is wonderful. It's a wholesome and inspiring story, but it's a lot of fun, too. I know I've watched it many times growing up, and I still love it to this day, and I would love to see it on the registry one day. Plus, James MacArthur and that the Disney star. I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> well, true. But we did a whole video on James MacArthur, so people should That's check. Right. People should check that out. Digging the details, Walt Disney's serious actor. <laughs> and I don't know if I'd say lesser known, but he certainly is not one you always think of right away. But he's wonderful, and people need to his they, performance in Third Man on the Mountain, especially. <laughs> I agree with one one hundred percent. And don't forget. Robert Stevenson directed James MacArthur in Kidnapped, so you must see that as well. So there's a little recap, everyone, for <laughs> of our <Preview>. James <laughs> MacArthur video. So in addition to Disney proper films, um, in recent days, everybody knows Disney has acquired many other properties by now, such as Pixar, Marvel, Star Wars, and now even 20th Century Fox, or now 20th Century Studios, whatever you want to call it these days. So there are films from all of those studios on this list as well. So for anyone interested in such films as Toy Story, Star Wars, A New Hope, Iron Man, those are all on this list in addition to many, many other great films. We wanted to focus as part of Disney 100 on Disney proper only i think a lot of people these days consider lots of these other wonderful studios a huge part of disney and as you can see on some of the promotional stuff for disney 100 <laughs> it's sort of overtaken the celebration but i think jim you and i find a lot of importance in focusing on disney in disney 100 right they'll have their their time to shine when when they have their anniversaries over at the other studios but Disney 100 is where it's at for, for now. <laughs> I agree, obviously, because we're doing this. But Disney 100 indeed, but especially Walt Disney. Yes. The man who started it all in 1923. It's incredible that all of this came because of this one person. And everything at Disney still follows his philosophies, his storytelling principles, everything that he developed, uh, which are so unique. Or they either follow it, try to follow it, or should be following it. Let's put it that way. <laughs> right. But without Walt Disney, there's no Disney 100. So good, good point. And the National Film Registry helps us remember Walt Disney was not just a marketer, not just a businessman, not just an entrepreneur, but an incredible artist. And I think that when we look at some of the other films of his, such as the incredible Fantasia, which is in a category absolutely all by itself and one of the greatest films ever made, period. Not Disney films, any kind of films. There's just absolutely nothing like it, utterly unique and astounding to watch. So there's audacity for you. And at approximately 90 years old, Fantasia is still very, very audacious. <laughs> still very audacious to this day. Agreed. So... Great job looking at this National Film Registry, letting people know that 
it itself is very important to us as a people in terms of artistry, culture, all of the above, society. But then we can focus in on the Disney films and, and really remind ourselves why Disney's 100 and why people know the name still to this day. And it's still, to say the least, thriving. And there's nothing else like that. There is nothing else. There's no name that is so well known. People couldn't identify a Paramount film if their, if their lives depended on it, or an MGM film, or a Warner Brothers film. But Disney, everybody knows. Dean and I have been so thrilled to be able to get together in our Digging the Details show for this monumental occasion. It really is. How often, how often does a 100th anniversary come along? How often has anything endured for a hundred years and still going strong? So we are thrilled to be here together and we are thrilled to have you with us. We knew we had to do something very significant and important and substantial for Disney 100. So this has been thrilling to me and it's a joy to talk to you about our favorite subject being Disney. And Jim, thank you for having me as always as a co-host here on Digging the Details. And just want to also, in celebration of Disney 100, give a big thank you to Walter Elias Disney for bringing joy to my life and to the lives of so many countless others that countless. cannot be measured. It is priceless. And the mark he left on Hollywood and the world in general is monumental. Like you were just saying, and I just add my, my thanks to him for that and for keeping joy and innocence a, a thing to be celebrated. Beautifully put. So we feel that we have been celebrating Disney all along. And even as this hundred, this hundred year, passes we will like to keep celebrating it and hope, hope you'll all be with us for this journey as we continue to celebrate disney and other things too but especially disney so he's dean and he's jim and we'll see you next time on digging the details